Few corners of cinema remain as forever popular as the horror genre. One of the key reasons why this murky realm of film keeps on striking a chord with horror hounds is often down to how these pictures keep audiences on their toes. After all, this is a genre that specialises in catching you off guard with a shock twist or two designed to leave Jaws agape. Here, the spotlight isn't necessarily on movies that had a unique twist at play, but instead the focus is more on the features that outright lie to you when trying to entice you in with their plot details. And so, with that in mind then, I'm Ellie with What Culture here with 10 horror movies that lied about their premise. Number 10. Final Destination 5 was not a sequel. What we all saw in Final Destination 5 was very much what we were expecting in terms of the Grim Reaper hunting down those who'd earlier managed to avoid perishing as a bridge collapsed. Where the film lied, though, is that it was really a prequel to the original Final Destination, rather than the straight-up sequel it was billed as. With death seemingly thwarted as Final Destination 5 starts to wrap up, survivors Sam and Molly take a vacation to Paris as they look to put their recent traumas behind them. And it's there that the penny wonderfully drops that the plane these lovebirds have entered is the one and the same aircraft that explodes at the start of the original Final Destination picture. Number 9. Freddy's Dead is not the final nightmare Released in 1991, Freddy's Dead The Final Nightmare told two porkies in its title. Promoted as totally, absolutely, undoubtedly, unequivocally the death of Freddy Krueger and the A Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, this film ended up being followed by one more Elm Street picture, a crossover with Jason Voorhees, who himself had both a final chapter and a final Friday over in the Friday the 13th series, and an ill-fated remake starring Jackie Earl Haley. Yet the Elm Street crew went hard in reiterating that this really was it for Freddy. So much so that there was even a public funeral held for Kruger as the promotional push for the sixth film kicked into gear. Blown up by his own daughter with a pipe bomb at the close of The Final Nightmare, it didn't take long for Robert England's Freddy Krueger to resurface. Just three years later, both England and the Krueger character would be back for Wes Craven's A New Nightmare, which placed Freddy in the real world as he stalked those involved in making the prior movies. Number 8. Annabelle's major role in The Conjuring was actually minimal OK, OK, so to say The Conjuring outright lied about its overall plot would be a little unfair. Still, many a horror hound came out of a first watch of James Wan's 2013 picture, having just watched a film markedly different to what they were expecting. While The Conjuring was advertised as being about the spooky shenanigans terrorising the new home of the Perrin family, many presumed the movie would also involve a heavy presence from a creepy little doll named Annabelle. After all, Annabelle was front and centre in the vast majority of marketing material for the picture, and she slash it was likewise a focal point of the various trailers for The Conjuring. In fairness, the film does start by giving some insight into Annabelle as she's shown tormenting some student nurses. Unfortunately, this spotlight on the doll lasts all of five minutes before the story transitions to Ed and Lorraine Warren helping the parents with the eerie presence that's stalking them. Of course, Annabelle would later get to star in her own trilogy of movies, not to mention briefly appear in three other Conjuring Universe offerings, yet many were expecting the possessed item to have a far greater role to play in that first venture into this eight-feature and counting franchise. Number 7. Three From Hell Changes Its Firefly Lineup Fans had waited for 14 years to see Rob Zombie's Firefly family back in action. Last seen shot to death in an almighty blowout at the close of 2005's The Devil's Rejects, the finality of that demise meant that few ever expected to see from the Firefly folk again. So when it was announced that Zombie was bringing Otis Baby and Captain Spaulding back for one more ride in Three From Hell, fans were eager to see how the trio survived the events of the prior movie in order to embark on their latest mission of chaos and carnage. Unfortunately, real events meant that plans had to be changed by the time Time 3 from Hell was finally released in 2019. While the plan was always to once again showcase the aforementioned trio of Firefly characters, the declining health of Sid Haig, the man behind Captain Spaulding, meant the veteran actor's role in the picture had to be greatly reduced. As such, Spaulding is only featured in the opening few minutes of Three from Hell before the murderous incarcerated clown is killed by lethal injection. 
Once Otis and Baby escape from their respective prison confines, they soon meet up with a new family member, their half-brother Foxy, to keep the antics of Three from Hell focused on a trio. Number 6. Alien 3 did not take place on Earth Infamously, this 1992 picture is one that went through plentiful problems in pre-production. With several different screenplays in place and several directors walking away from the project before David Fincher eventually wound up on directorial duties. Not only was Alien 3 set to be a very different film to what we ultimately got, but 20th Century Fox got a little too eager when deciding to put out an early first teaser trailer for this threequel. In said teaser, a voiceover informs us that, in 1979, we discovered, in space, no one can hear you scream. In 1992, we will discover, on Earth, everyone can hear you scream. And with that, it had been outright stated to the masses that this third alien picture was taking its action to Earth. By the time Alien 3 hit cinemas, Earth wasn't featured in the slightest. Instead, the bulk of the action took place on the Fury 161 foundry. Number 5. Curse of Chucky is a continuation of the prior five Child's Play movies. Ahead of its release, Don Mancini kept one pivotal piece of Curse of Chucky information from those long-standing franchise fans eagerly awaiting the return of everyone's favourite good guy. This was a picture billed as a fresh start for the Child's Play series, following a nine-year break since 2004's Seed of Chucky. For Curse, it was back to the basics of just Chucky. Ignoring prior continuity, this was a film which was taking the series in a new direction. All that audiences knew before Curse of Chucky's release was Fiona Dorif was playing a character, Nika, who was grieving the loss of her mother. When a familiar red-headed doll turns up at the family home, the dead bodies soon begin to amass. The piece of information Mancini had been keeping from fans, though, was that Curse of Chucky was every bit a straight-up Child's Play 6. Not just is it shown in flashbacks how Charles Lee Ray was infatuated with Nika's mother and killed Nika's father, the film also brings back the Tiffany doll and Jennifer Tilly. Further cementing its status as a continuation of its five predecessors, Curse rewards long-standing fans with a post credit sequence that brings back the now-adult Andy Barkley, who Chucky tormented for the first three entries in the series. Number 4. It Comes at Night is totally not a zombie movie Taken directly from the film's official synopsis, It Comes at Night is a movie set after a mysterious apocalypse leaves the world with few survivors. Upon reading that and viewing the ooey-gooey imagery showcased by the film prior to its release, everyone and their undead dog thought that this was meant to be some sort of zombie affair. Things are a smidge different than expected in this 2017 Edward Schultz effort, mind. The early footage of the film may have been brimming with decrepit bodies infecting others by dripping them in a black ooze, yet It Comes at Night is far from your usual shuffling undead sort of picture. No, instead, the it of the movie's title is more about the paranoid tricks the human mind can play rather than being about any zombified being that's coming to devour your flesh. Instead of a splatterfest of bloodshed and bones, Schultz's feature is effectively a delicate character study that nicely positions emotions like grief, fear and anxiety as the big bads of the piece. Number 3. Despite the crazed frenzy it generated, The Blair Witch Project was not real. Here in 2022, 23 years after the movie's release, it's almost laughable that anyone would genuinely think the events of The Blair Witch Project were entirely real. For those of us old enough to remember said release, though, that was very much the case back in 1999. Daniel Merrick and Eduardo Sanchez's film didn't totally lie about what you were about to see, with The Blair Witch Project promoted as a feature based around three documentary makers exploring the purported myth of the titular witch. Where the lie the part comes into things is how this 99 effort was likewise promoted as being real footage from real filmmakers who really went missing when seeking out the eerie presence that was said to reside in the woods of Burkittsville, Maryland. One has to remember, this was a time when the internet was in its infancy and before people realised that, you know, just because information is online doesn't mean it's always true. Not just was the Blair Witch Project stated to be real, but the smart duo of Mirak and Sanchez had created a website months ahead of the film even being announced. 
what was so special about this website? Why it was a missing person site looking for help in finding the trio of Heather Donahue, Michael Williams and Joshua Leonard, the three faux filmmakers from the movie. Number 2. Jason takes a small part of Manhattan eventually. There's no denying that so much of Friday the 13th Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan just makes absolutely no sense. What Horror Hounds Will Promise was a movie where Jason is rampaging in the Big Apple, slicing and dicing any poor souls who happen to get in his way. Instead, what audiences actually got is a picture which spends barely 20 minutes of its 100 minute runtime in New York City. How exactly does Jason take Manhattan? Well, he kicks some kid's boombox over, kills a cop and famously punches the head off the shoulders of VC Dupree's Julius. Can that be classed as a taking of Manhattan? Of course not. It's the sheer lack of time in New York City that's the real kicker though, for this 8th Friday the 13th film was billed as Camp Crystal Lake's most iconic son on a lengthy tear through Times Square and beyond. Added to the utter confusion of this offering, when did Camp Crystal Lake become attached to the ocean? Why was it deemed logical to sail to New York rather than go by car or train? And why the hell did somebody think it was wise to develop a movie that basically dumped Jason on the love boat? Number 1. From the Depths was not about a shark attack survivor 2020's From the Depths is certainly a unique entry into the shark movie subgenre. Rather than the regular approach of dropping some unsuspecting victims into a situation where the ocean's apex predators are circling in, From the Depths picks up the action after a shark attack. Liz is the survivor of just such an attack which saw her boyfriend and Liz's older sister killed. Very definitely earning that aforementioned unique label, the movie sees Liz stalked by visions of a shark. By that, she literally sees a great white floating down the hallways of her house or creeping behind the blinds in her psychiatrist's office. Adding to her trauma, Liz is also visited by the rotting ghosts of her deceased beau and sibling, with it revealed that the two were having an affair behind Liz's back. All of this is explored and experienced as our central character is in a relatively new relationship with Roberta, and it's Roberta who has a major role to play during the final few minutes of From the Depths. There, the audience realises that Liz is not the shark attack survivor that we were led to believe. Instead, Liz is shown on an operating table, with it detailed how she also died from the shark attack that took two other lives. As for Roberta, she, along with psychiatrist Kristen, are the doctors who declare Liz dead due to blood loss. And that concludes our list. If you think we missed any, then do let us know in the comments below. And while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe and tap that notification bell. Also, head over to Twitter and follow us there. And I can be found across various social medias just by searching Ellie Little Child. I've been Ellie with What Culture. I hope you have a magical day, and I'll see you real soon.